Welcome back everybody to When the Dutch Went to Space. We've arrived at episode number 21. Uh, this episode is called Strange New Worlds. Though technically they're mostly moons, but uh, I'll just run with it. Uh, starting up at the 1st of August, we have Bobby E10. Remember we brought it into an orbit of Mars? Well, it's time to deploy that payload. And uh, we are releasing the lander after it's done about 100 days of gathering science. And you can see the uh, the orbiter boosting itself back up to a high orbit. We have plenty of Delta V left. We have some good ideas. Um, the aeroshell is entering the Martian upper atmosphere, and the ionization of the of the particles will make radio transmissions typically impossible. Uh, but for some reason, we have great communications. Parachutes deploy at 33 kilometers this is called the six minutes of terror because normally we only communicate once we are back on the ground but we had a good data link all the way and you can see the craft slow down heading down to the martian plains near the equator deploying the aerosol i almost forgot this and um, we are going to use the heat sails also as a buffer to to land because it uh, it can take quite a beating in uh, and our and our wheels can't so we're using the uh, the heat shield and uh, we have a successful landing at mars in 1972. Uh, we have to of course jettison the uh, descent stage and uh, just to show you that we have double antennas we have a very low relay link uh, using the direct VHF connection on the craft, but we also have a high gain antenna on the craft that we can use for a direct link to the space center, which is currently not in view, but it will be once we start pumping out all that science. And you can see the rover gathering rocks and samples and science and stuff. It's got a Bon Voyage on it, so it's going to make a great drive across the surface of Mars. It's got a couple of nuclear reactors and solar panels so when we have excessive amounts of power requests uh, particularly when we're transmitting lots of data we have a little bit of extra uh, information but um, yeah one of the first crafts that drove um, at the first attempt like we uh, the E should already tell you that this is the fifth generation of rovers we're getting better at it but I was surprised we, we made it all the way in one piece and the trick I'm gonna tell you is to build an aeroshell that is really, really large, like four meters diameter, uh, a ton of payload, like literally one ton. That's sort of a good, good ratio to slow you down using the atmosphere. If you make everything too compact, it's just gonna crash into Mars. You can see the rover here sampling some interesting Martian rocks, looking for signs of life much like Curiosity is doing right now and the Viking Liners before it. And um, on August 14, 1972, we have another Huygens mission. Like the D series of the Huygens craft is it's just a very good craft and it has lots of Delta V. I designed it for multiple missions. The D5 is heading for Jupiter. You'll see it in a, uh, by the end of the episode. But um, yeah, we build a couple of more of them. This is the D6 heading to Vesta. I picked up the small bodies contract. And this won't happen in real life until 2011 with the Dawn mission. When we actually send the spacecraft there. But we'll beat them by uh, about 40 years. Next up, August 16, is ECS-3 launching on our Europa 1B. And finally, I dropped the boosters a little bit to make it look prettier. ECS stands for European Communication System. And we already have two of these networks in place, but yeah, our, our communications technology keeps evolving. We are now at level seven for the antenna, which uh, gives us a lot more power in the transmissions. And this one's not targeting low Earth orbit. This one's heading for the moon. So you see a, a small evolution of the Crive kick stage that we've been using for a long time now. And uh, we're, we're heading to the moon. We're going to build a relay network around the moon. This is... I don't think NASA has done that. We have a couple of satellites out there that relay data. Of course, the Soviets did it back when they landed, uh, photographed the back of the moon. Well, basically, I think they bounced it on the satellite. I am 
definitely sure, I'm not sure about that one, I'm definitely sure about the Chinese on the uh, Changye uh, mission. You have Guangzhou 1, I do hope I pronounced that correctly, in 2018. That is a relay satellite that's uh, circling the moon, helping the Chinese spacecraft to navigate. And of course, um, recently they did the far side moon landing and sample return, which of course also required a relay network. Uh, you can see as we're in quite a high orbit, we are um, deploying the satellite at a 2 million kilometer orbit. Uh, to, yeah. um, so we, we um, have sort of a 120 degree separations. They have line of sight of each other and they have, at least one of them has line of sight with Earth. So that should give us a complete cover. I, um, I did mix up the insertion of the third satellite. So it's not a complete 120 degree network, but this, in addition to all the satellites that we have in orbit around the moon, which are quite a few, should now give us a, yeah, a almost complete coverage. And we're going to need that because we might switch to a new type of lander that uh, does not require a, a pilot. So I told you about the Huygens series. We built a couple of them. This is number D7 heading to Mercury. And there's one more in the pipeline, but I don't think we'll get, get to see that in this episode. Uh, D7 is heading to Mercury. And um, Mercury in real life was visited for the first time by Mariner... What, what Mariner 10? 5? 7? I don't remember. 1975. The, um, the youth were, were really the first to head out to these corners of the solar system with a Mercury um, a Mariner program which was highly successful and um, as will our Huygens program be of course we did do something wrong I'm not sure what I did this is the insertion burn and it's quite a lengthy burn and um, for some reason we did not align our plane properly I don't know so we ended up missing Mercury like we did before and remember we, we, we did try to go to Mercury before but now we have plenty and plenty of fuel to make a correction burn and uh, we made one with the transit stage about uh, 111 meters per second and then we used the RCS thrusters on the probe itself for the second one so uh, yeah we're well in place we have an accident at Space Lab Beta well small accident I was gonna jettison the supply container and as I was doing that I uh, accidentally pressed uh, decouple rather than undock which would decouple the entire docking port which of course in real life is quite impossible but it happened and I figured I, I, I tried to rescue the mission so or the station and I'm, I'm slowly navigating my my way back to the station but now I don't have a docking port to align to so I have to do this all by visual navigating putting the craft close to each other and within I believe three to four meters of the uh, the Kerbal that is going to attach the panels back, which is uh, Marion Hernandez, our resident engineer, and I discovered that we don't have uh, enough nitrogen. So I temporarily removed the dock from the supply craft, added it to the, uh, the docking station, and uh, Marion quickly gets back on board, and uh, we have to relocate our spacecraft in the hopes that the hatch is actually pointing in the correct direction in, in somewhere between where the orientation where I can grab on to the docking node and the attachment point um, which you can see sort of clamped to the side of the of the Canadian uh, or the Japanese module there we go we're moving our way through it and I'm carefully also trying to um, get the rotation properly you can see the door pointing sort of 45 degrees and which will make docking more difficult and uh, yeah and by removing that part we also have, don't have control on the station so this took a bit of fiddling and Marion manages to fix it uh, which is good news because she can't let go of the ladder that would probably drift her off in, uh, that would drift her off in space and she'd be hard to catch yeah, so the, the crew on Space Lab uh, Beta is very, very tired after their 140 day stay at the station. They all have ranked up uh, stress levels of up to 
70-80% they're all deep in the red and I should bring them home aborting our two-year stay in space mission like our multi-month experiment so um, this is an incremental experiment so I can pick it up later I just have to send up a new crew with enough supplies um, but you'll see that in a later episode for now we're bringing the crew back we're abandoning the station for a moment we do have one spacecraft ready that could um, uh, do the crew rotation so we have a craft ready at Tessel to send up a new crew but we don't have a supply craft ready and I have a I have an idea for for improving that and uh, based on the TKS spacecraft that the Russians are developing but you'll see that at a later point because it's September 23 and we have shocking blue number three arriving at Venus Venus is proven to be very tough not only to get into orbit but also to land something on it and this is the third attempt of actually doing that uh, we still have one of the Chandra probes in orbit and shocking blue too who had a failed lander but is a great relay and we're launching in almost the same plane which is very very good for us because this will give us a second relay satellite that the lander will be able to lose this time we don't have any wobble you remember last time we were wobbling all over the place and ending up in a very high orbit this will end up in about a 10 hour orbit which is good beautiful sunrise over venus once we reach our um, the highest point in our orbit, we're releasing the transit stage, so we have we don't have to carry that weight, and we can lower the orbit using RCS and then detach our probe. There she goes, and of course we have to bring the satellite back up to speed, and you can see the um, the RCS tank on the back of the craft. Uh, so she's boosting her orbit back, not completely that high, so she's skimming the atmosphere getting a very low point at venus hopefully to get the best possible communication uh, connection with our landed probe once it gets down and if it gets down uh, because this is a tough atmosphere it, it it hits you like a like a brick like a brick wall but uh, it also doesn't last that long to slow down and we only spent like i don't remember like something like four or five percent of our ablator on the heat shield I'm very happy with the miniature aero brakes. They will burn off at a later point in time, but uh, the, due to the pressure, but they really help to align the craft. You can see the solar pylons tucked away into the heat shield and the parachute. So this took an ages. So I spat up the descent footage, um, I think 16 or 32 times. This took forever. Uh, similar to the Mars landing, if you get your ratio between weight and uh, surface right, the atmosphere will do most of the work for you and actually slow you down. And here we go. Cool camera shot missing the actual landing. Now the probe has power for about five days, so get on with it and get a relay to one of those shopping brew relay satellites and pass out all the data. Speaking of relay satellites, over at Mars, we still have the relay satellite for the Bobby lander. You remember the rover in the beginning of the episode? Well, I put the relay satellite in a plane where it could actually reach the moons. And with the high gain antenna deployed on the rover, well, why keep the orbitary in place? So uh, we can do some more science. And here we have a flyby of Phobos, one of the actually the smallest moon of Mars. And um, we were doing a very tight flyby. We're aiming for this little hole in the side of the potato and we're passing at about five kilometers altitude. So this needs to go exactly right. But it's, it's gonna teach us so much about the composition of this moon and, and the way all the structure is done and whether we might be able to land or even build a base on it who knows this was a very cool nail-biting flyby and um, yeah of course when you have a probe in orbit of mars and since demos and phobos are more or less in the same plane why not speak uh, take the craft to demos as well so um yeah, so the, the relay crafts mission we're about two years into this mission 
and uh, I decided to put the satellite in orbit of Deimos and I'm going to attempt a landing in the future once we've collected all the science but that's for a different episode because we've arrived at our final craft the 5th of October Huygens D5 is visiting Jupiter in 1972 so this is another first the Americans will send Pioneer 10 and 11 in 1973 and 1974 and then they'll make some very cool observations before we get the Voyagers of course and uh, we're doing a flyby of Jupiter but I noticed that we could use the gravity of Jupiter to do a plane change and we're lifting the orbit slightly and that puts us on a new trajectory and we are on our way to visit Europa. Yeah, I, I didn't plan this in advance. I, uh, I noticed it once the, uh, the probe was in, in the sphere of influence of Jupiter. Look at those gorgeous pictures, uh, which have now gone. Yeah, that happens. Um, but as we leave, we notice that there is another moon in our path, and it's going to take all of our RCS reserves to actually align and uh, slow our craft a little bit down so we're going to hit that moon as well but Ganymede is actually very very close well not close but very close to the true our trajectory and uh, there she is or he is I'm not sure Ganymede the moons are named after the daughters from Zeus I think um, or the uh, giants I don't remember my Greek mythology um, regardless it has something to do with Greek mythology and Ganymede is the largest of the moon it's one of the Galilean moons the moons that Galileo observed through his little telescope who by the way he got from Antony from Leeuwenhoek the Dutch scientist who invented the microscope uh, but that's something for a different episodes I hope you enjoyed this this was episode number 21 and for the next episode I hope you will join me because we have some exciting news or maybe not exciting, troubling news because we may have a death at the moon.